<clears throat> Thanks, Sharisha. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for having me back. Thanks to Amber, Victor, Chris, and the whole team for making these conferences happen. And my goal today will be to bring up some antiretroviral or HIV treatment controversies, what I feel are the latest hot topics and unclear questions in the field. And so I'll give you some scenarios, some things to reflect on, ask you your thoughts. And I'm not going to be talking about PrEP controversies. I believe Jared will be doing an ACC on PrEP after the new year. So I'm going to leave that to Jared. I don't have any conflicts of interest. I will mention a few investigational therapies. And these are the topics that I came up with when I thought about the hottest questions in the field of HIV treatment. So one, do the latest ARVs, Dolutavir, Bictavir, TAF in particular, lead to more weight gain than older agents? Does Dolutavir increase the risk of neural tube defects? What are the advantages of dual or two drug ART? And a couple other quicker questions and conundrums. Let me first just remind you of the latest HIV treatment guidelines, the quote unquote first line or recommended therapies. These are from the Department of Health and Human Services and on the right from the IAS USA. I think that most clinicians in our clinic and worldwide are really opting for big tag of FTC TAF if there's insurance coverage and access as first line for treatment of individuals followed by dolutegravir plus FTC TAF if there's not access. I can't remember the last time I started somebody on dolutegravir, bacavir, lamivudine, which is Triamec, or on, this last, on the last option for first-line therapy. So as background to everything I'm going to talk about, I think that a really common question in the clinic nowadays from patients and providers is for a person taking a an agent that is no longer on that list of first-line therapy, should there be a switch, should there be an update? These are a couple of examples that came to my mind. And really the, the question a lot of what I'm gonna talk about today gets at, I think is how do we compare the benefits of newer agents, Dolutegravir, Bictegravir, TAF, for example, all the advantages we know of, faster viral expression with those integrase inhibitors, better tolerability, better a durable and long-term adherence versus how well do we understand all the risks and really should we be early adopters of these new therapies versus should we be a little more cautious and wait for post-marketing data. So let's keep that in the back of our minds and turn first to this question about weight gain, which I think is coming up a lot. There have been lots of headlines about it, lots of questions about it. And I think this is an important topic, not only because it is important to people with HIV who are taking therapy and want to you know, understand all the body changes that happen with ART and uh, because we know there are high rates of medical comorbidities and other things over time and I think we as clinicians want to understand that better. First sharing an actual case from Madison Clinic thanks to Liz Duke if Liz is here. Thank you Liz. So this is a patient in their 40s. I'm in potentially not giving you all the demographics to keep it non-identifiable. Uh, this person re-engaged in care at Madison Clinic about three years ago at that time, had been off ART, CD4 count was 21, viral load was about a million. Based on resistance, started dolutegravir, ropivirine, FTC, TAF, where I use abbreviations, I'll, I will try to spell out the names. And this person experienced about 55 pounds of weight gain over two years. You can see here the graph, which is in pounds over about two years. And you can see here the trajectory and then perhaps some plateauing and I'll come back to why I think that's important. Here's the BMI change. Uh, as far as I could tell, there was no new diabetes or blood pressure issues or other comorbidities. But I, I, the question that came up in clinic is how much of this is return to health? How much of this is viral load suppression, reducing the catabolic effects of untreated HIV? How much of this is diet or lifestyle? And how much of this is related to the ART therapy particularly Dolutegravir and TAF, and the million dollar question, would this be different with other ARVs? And would you change ART based on this finding? But show of hands, whether you're a prescriber or not prescriber, would you recommend a change of ART based on this alone? Any, would anyone change ART by show of hands? Bob would, Ann, Janine, yeah. So a couple, a couple hands, a couple, a couple middle of the road hands, maybe. Okay, so I think this is fascinating. Thank you, and we'll, 
uh, come back to that. So first, I'm going to focus on the data for weight change in treatment naive studies. These are the retrospective analyses. Uh, the first one we talked about after Croy, uh, a very large cohort from NA Accord, which did identify greater changes in weight, greater weight gain with integrase inhibitors compared to NRTIs for treatment naive individuals. This study really called out dolutegravir which has been consistent across a number of studies. This one also called out raltegravir, which I've not seen in other trials. Uh, this more recent study presented in October, which looked at a very large number from the same cohort, did find that integrase or protease inhibitor initiation increased diabetes risk compared to NRTIs. And then this much smaller study from the armed forces, which primarily enrolled young, otherwise healthy men, pretty well split between black African-American men and Caucasian men identified that the participants with the greatest weight gain were those uh, black African black African American men who started with a BMI above 25 and took an integrase inhibitor. They actually suggested that for this group in particular, maybe we should be starting, maybe we should go back in time and start NNRTIs. I think that is very controversial, and I'd love to know what you think about that, but let's first turn, let's next turn to the prospective data, which I think is much stronger. So this is a trial called ADVANCE performed in Sub-Saharan Africa. So this is a randomized control trial, primarily in black African individuals. One, one real uh, boon or advantage of this trial is they enrolled 60% women, which has been an issue in a lot of the other randomized control trials. The average CD4 count at baseline was about 350. And participants were randomized to three different arms. So I think this gives us very strong comparisons either dolutegravir with FTC-TDF, which is Truvada, or dolutegravir FTC-TAF, which is this COBE, or uh, what in this country we would call a tripla favorins with FTC-TDF. You can see here change in weight in kilograms for each of the regimens uh, divided into female participants and male participants. And I think we can note a couple very clear findings here. So first, the greatest weight gain occurred in the dolutegravir-TAF arms. Uh, the least in the efavirenz arm, and greater weight gain occurred in women as compared to men. If you look at this publication, they actually have a graph of the weight change, and this is 48 weeks, I should note that, and it's pretty linear, which I think, and I'm gonna come back to that, over the first 48 weeks, it really did look like a linear change. The update from the European AIDS uh, conference, which was just a week ago, was out to 96 weeks, the change really was linear in black African men, but, uh, excuse me, really was linear all the way to 96 weeks in black African women, but it's plateaued after the first year in black African men. They did find, this is from the update a week ago, they did find higher rates of metabolic syndrome and incident obesity, most in the dolutegravir TAF arm followed by the other two arms. So thinking about clinical outcomes, that was the finding of this trial and I'll compare that to other studies in a moment. The other, I think, big question is when we say that, when we look at weight gain, I think that's really a simplification, and the question is, what is the composition of that weight? And this is one of the only studies I've seen that looked at that. They actually did DEXA scans to see where that weight occurred and uh, what the composition of that weight was, and interestingly, the weight in the Fabrin's arm was primarily uh, was primarily composed of fat, whereas in the other arms, it was really a mix of fat and non-fat lean mass. So I think that there is a lot we do not fully understand, but this is some of the best perspective data we have. The other very large trial, which was just published, led by Paul Sachs, uh, was a pooled analysis of eight randomized controlled trials in treatment-naive individuals that accumulated 5,000 participants and over 10,000 person years of follow-up at 96 weeks. You can see here the median weight change was two kilos. Of note, this is the interquartile ratio, so some do not gain weight, some gain more than that. And they divided it into risk factors for any weight gain or risk factors for greater than 10% uh, body weight change. And you can see here, I've bolded what was the strongest association in the trial, which was lower CD4 count at baseline. And then I think the other notable things was that more weight gain tended to occur uh, in both groups. Uh, in women and in black individuals, although in these trials, I would also note that the number of women was small, 10 to 15% in each of the trials, and 25% about uh, black individuals. So I think that in many of the studies, um, women, especially black women, tend to gain more weight than others. In this trial, the most weight occurred in black women, 
followed by black men, and that really reflected trends in weight and obesity uh, around um, overall in the country, including in individuals without HIV. And then I, I think the probably the most fascinating part of this is when they compared all the trials that looked like a newer agent compared to an older, older agent, in every one, the newer agent led to more weight gain than the older agent. So the question becomes, why? And I don't think anyone knows, but in this study, every new comparator led to more weight gain than an older uh, comparator. This is data from Heidi and Mari's cohort, Scenix. Um, Heidi, feel free to jump in if I get anything wrong. And I just I kind of want you to see the, uh, these are the GAN plots, I just kind of want you to see the trends here. In this very large cohort of about 3,000 individuals, uh, integrase inhibitors and protease inhibitors started for treatment naive persons did lead to more weight gain than NNRTIs. The most weight gain occurred here with dolutegravir and TAF, followed by darunavir and then dolutegravir TDF. And I, this is short term weight gain about six months here and what you see it is pretty linear this is long-term weight change again the dolutegravir arms led to greater weight gain than other integrase inhibitors and i just wanted to highlight that there does seem to be a bit of a, a, a plateau here somewhere in the one to two year mark um Hi, is there anything you want to add at the end? Okay, so I, I, again, I think it's really interesting that in the short term, there does seem to be some change or some difference between the agents. In the longer term, the differences do become smaller. Uh, a question that's come up is how does Big Tegravir fit into this? And from the uh, initial randomized control trials are the only randomized control trials where I've seen this. You can see that the weight change with Big Tegravir seem to be equivalent uh, to the dolutegravir arms when combined with TAF. And again, the TAF arms do lead to more weight change than the non-TAF uh, comparator NRTIs. So this is my summary. I'd love to hear your thoughts of weight change for treatment naive individuals. I think most individuals do gain weight in the first one to two years. I think some uh, persons with HIV gain more than others and may surpass their quote unquote return to health uh, BMI or weight, and some may surpass their goal BMI. I think there are a lot of factors separate from the antiretrovirals. CD4 count seems to be a very strong one in a lot of the studies, uh, sex and race, race or ethnicity, which I think reflects very complicated social determinants of health, uh, which is beyond uh, the scope of this talk. And then again, the million dollar question, how do the antiretrovirals compare and do the new ARVs are they associated with more weight gain in the older comparators? It does seem to be yes, but the mechanism of this, I think, is clearly unknown. It's been proposed that maybe these are simply more tolerable. You know, we have, I think a lot of us have seen, uh, albeit uncommonly, nausea, decreased appetite with TDF, with some of the older agents. So maybe these uh, agents are simply have better tolerability and people's appetite is better and it's affecting calorie intake. Um, that's, I, I will be honest, that's my suspicion. Uh, direct toxicity, I have not seen any mechanism except a proposed mechanism for dolutegravir, which did, um, uh, uh, which has been shown in lab studies to increase melanocyte stimulating hormone, which affects appetite, but I think, again, not confirmed, lab studies, um, not the strongest data. A lot of the studies controlled for viral load and found changes in weight, even with you know, equivalent rates of viral load suppression, so I think this is not likely the full answer. And then again, the long-term consequences. And you know, while there is statistical significance looking at a lot of these differences, is there clinical significance? And I think the data is all over the map in terms of consequences like new metabolic syndrome, uh, new diabetes, or other metabolic changes. And I think we need longer-term follow-up. So I'll let you reflect on this. Should this affect your choice of initial ART for everyone or for uh, select individuals or not at all. So uh, we'll come back to that. I'd like to hear what you think about it uh, more quickly, a case than a discussion of the switch studies that have looked at weight change. A and again, going back here, I think the other big question is the composition of the weight change. And I think just saying weight gain is a vast oversimplification. And does this lead to uh, sort of generalized weight change or increases in visceral fat, which we know is more associated with metabolic changes? Again, I think we uh, need more investigation of that. So here's a case which is composite of a couple that I've seen and heard about in clinic, including one that Bob mentioned to me. So this is a young cisgender woman who had been stable on a Favrin's FTC TDF or a Tripla for a few years, switches to dolutegravir plus FTC TAF to reduce toxicity risk, then experiences a rather substantial weight gain and reports no other changes to calorie intake or activity level and requests to switch back 
to a Favarin. So my question for you to think about, how would you counsel her? Would you switch back or would you recommend a switch to something else? Again, I pose these questions because I do not know the right answer. Nina? So I'm, I'm curious to know, um, if the pressure to choose and care um, on the Favarin for four years, like we need to map out what the weight trend was before the switch happened. And so that's one of the things I, I'm always curious about. It's like, what's the slope? <laughs> There, there are distinctly different changes here. Because I actually think that, you know, you can do sort of like a rough time series analysis just looking at like, because we have these data captured in our system. Absolutely. For remote participants who may not have heard that, Nina's comment, which I appreciate, is what was the slope or change for these years on a Favrins and how did it compare to after? For so, so, the, so what I'm getting at is that there is a distinct change in slope that, that um, there's a stronger causal inference. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I appreciate you putting that out there. So let's, for the sake of this discussion, posit that there was a change in slope. And I think that, and I have heard about two or three cases in the clinic where this question has come up and where I think there really was a distinct change in slope. So thank you, Nina, for um, putting that out there. I'm not going to go through this, but just to show you what a hot topic this is, these are 11 studies presented in the last year looking at weight change after a change to an integrase inhibitor. And you can get a sense that the majority did find a association uh, after the switch, again, largely with uh, dolutegravir. And these last trials that did not, I would just note that some of them had very low uh, uh, enrollment of women, of black individuals. And, and, and I think the challenge in interpreting this data is they all had different definitions for the weight change. They all had different demographic makeups. They all had different follow-up and outcomes. So I think this is hard to interpret, but again, a very hot topic with a lot of suggestion for an association. Um, also, some studies with a, a suggestion of association of weight change after a switch from TDF to TAF, but small, largely single center, again, highly variable in their methods. So, and again, going back to that advanced trial, the prospective trial, one, um, just one second. Uh, I think that that is probably the best data that did find a difference in weight change with dolutegravir combined with TAF compared to dolutegravir plus TDF. So maybe and I'll give my quick summary and then we'll love to hear your question or comment. So I think in terms of weight change and switch studies, I think that data is harder to interpret. I think the retrospective studies suggest weight gain occurs after a switch to an integrase inhibitor, especially dolutegravir, less known for a switch to bictegravir or a switch from TDF to TAF. Again, I think that these factors make it hard to interpret. And I think, again, the long-term consequences are quite unclear. Anne? What I just wanted to point out, which is what you just pointed out, is that that long list of studies that you said, I don't know if this is on, it's on, um, were retrospective and not randomized. And that what there is a definite need for would be some kind of larger randomized study that would address the switch question that would hopefully bring a little bit more clarity than we currently have. Absolutely. Really appreciate that comment, and if I can put a question back to you, and do you know of any planned randomized trials looking at that? Okay. So that. Planned from switch to dietary and people who had a certain amount of weight gain that would change details. Thank you, Anne. If you couldn't hear that comment, there are planned randomized control trials to look at switch and weight change after that. Sylvia? Yeah. Th thank you for the question, Sylvia, for adding that. And so just if you didn't hear that, the question about the injectables, either treatment or prep and weight change. So Rafi Landovitz from UCLA did present that at CROI, the small number of participants of um, men without HIV who got cabotegravir, I think it was versus placebo, there was no weight difference, which I think also is intriguing. I don't want to steal Jared's thunder for his ACC after the new year, but if you look in the DISCOVER trial at FTC TAF versus FTC TDF, there was a small but statistically significant difference in weight change of about a kilo. Again, statistical significance versus clinical significance, I think, is largely debatable. Jihan? I also, I also think it'll be interesting to see what the slope of weight change um, in the American population is in general as well, because I know that America is getting bigger and heavier. And so it just would be sort of curious. 
I, I mean, I, you know, it'd just be interesting to see how those slopes um, mirror each other or not. Absolutely. And I do think that, uh, especially in that study you presented from Paul Sachs, is a note that they make that there are some of these data do reflect overall trends in the United States uh, for weight change and obesity. Thank you, Jihan. Okay, so I'm going to let you reflect on this. How should we be counseling about potential weight change when discussing switches? How do we weigh that uh, between all the benefits, uh, potential benefits of TAF or of Dolly Tegavir and Bic Tegavir? And for a person in the scenario I presented, would you switch back to a Favarin's? Um, anybody had that come up? Anybody switched back from an integrase inhibitor based on weight change? Bob and Ann, thank you. So, so th that's so uh, if you didn't hear that, so Bob and Ann have both switched back. Uh, Bob said, too soon to tell. I haven't seen the person back to see if weight actually decreased. And Ann's comment was that after a switch back, weight stabilized. Nina? I ended up switching um, one of my, uh, she's also a black woman, um, patients to um, uh, Drabrine, mm. actually. Um, the... And it's, uh, I would also say it's too soon to tell, but part of what prompted me was actually my comment on the slope change, because I actually, she had, um, she, prior to her, um, <clears throat> she had actually an, a bunch of longitudinal data in the EPIC system at an outside facility where you could see that her weight was, pretty, I mean, she was obese, but she, her weight was quite stable. And then, um, and then it just sort of took off when I After started. After the switch. Her, yeah. Um, and so I'm very curious to see what her slope change. Absolutely. I'd be curious too, if you can report back in any way. So thank you all for those comments. Really appreciate uh, you all sharing. I'm going to go ahead and turn to a different topic. I think also a topic that has affected clinical decision-making and clinical care over the past, I'd say, you know, year to two years. So does Dolly Tabor increase the risk of neural tube defects? I'd like to show you the update this summer from the IAS conference. Uh, but first, let me again propose or, or present a scenario from clinic, uh, actual patient in my clinic. And I think I presented this uh, last year. And I just want to compare and see what you all think. So 38-year-old cisgender woman with HIV, well-controlled and Dolly Tegavir plus FTC TDF, which prior to all this data we had selected because we thought it was a great regimen uh, for conception. And then the landscape changed. Her husband, also in our clinic has HIV with a documented suppressed HIV viral load. She is very eager to conceive and is seeking assisted reproductive services. So would you recommend a change of dolutegravir to a different agent? Not going to ask you which agent yet, but would you change dolutegravir by show of hands? Okay, I, uh, scattered hands. I, I want to say fewer than a year ago, but a uh, scattered show of hands. So thank you. <clears throat> so I think as background, and I think this is a fascinating story. So this was done in Botswana. It was an observational study. It was started in 2014 actually to look for neural tube defects as a consequence of a favorins, which for a while there was concern about, and I think that concern has really fallen by the wayside. So started to, to observe whether those occurred on a favorins, and then Botswana was the first country in Sub-Saharan Africa to introduce dolutegravir in 2016, so they began to observe events from dolutegravir. And this planned preliminary analysis in May 2018 really, I don't think, expected to detect any problem with dolutegravir, but what they found was four neural, neural tube defects, all of which were different defects out of 426 infants born to women who initiated dolutegravir prior to conception. You can see here the rate compared with non-dolutegravir ART, which was primarily a favorins, which was a statistic, statistically significant difference and did lead to an FDA alert. And I think, again, a lot of changes to clinical decision-making. Uh, that summer, we got an update, no additional neural tube defects out of uh, a handful of more uh, noted incidences of dolutegravir before conception, so 0.67%, which we will come back and compare that to the update we got this summer. As background, I think the unanswered questions here are, again, could dolutegravir cause this effect directly, or could it be non-ARV-related factors? I think a really notable thing is that Botswana is a country that does not uh, supplement flour grains or any food source with folate. Again, there is lab data that dolutegravir may have a mechanism of antagonizing folate. This was from zebrafish. But in that study of zebrafish, giving folate did, uh, did eliminate that higher risk of neural tube defects. So uh, take that for what it is. 
uh, and WHO is now disseminating and rolling out what's being called TLD, TDF, 3DC, Dolly Tegavir. So this has huge clinical implications around the world. This is the update from IES. I'll show it to you as a table and then a graph. And again, we're comparing to a year prior, which was on Dolly Tegavir conception, four out of 596. There was one additional neural tube defect in the Dolly Tegavir arm <clears throat> out of a more substantial number of overall cases. What happened was the investigators expanded their surveillance sites from eight to 18 to capture more uh, instances of conception and delivery for an overall percent of 0.3% compared to 0.1 with non-Dolly uh, non Tegavir, again, mostly efavirenz. So the overall rate decreased with more observed uh, instances. This is the same data as a graph, so you can see it here, dolutegravir compared to non-dolutegravir ART, and the uh, confidence intervals did overlap. This is my recreation, so you can see a more accurate uh, graph uh, in the publication, but I did my best here, and these definitely did overlap. And of note, 99.8% of women for whom folate was prescribed started taking it uh, during pregnancy, not before, so not at the time of conception. And again, this is a country that does not fortify their food supply with folate. So the investigator, investigator conclusion was that the prevalence of neural tube defects was slightly higher in association with dolutegravir exposure. The relative risk, three uh, in 1,000 versus one in 1,000, uh, but absolute risk quite low, and a number of limitations which you can read here, and, and I think one of the biggest limitations is, while this is incredibly robust data, over 120,000 instances of ARV use at conception uh, or at conception during, or pregnancy, this really is only data for Dolly Tegavir and Fabrins, and we do not have nearly as robust data for other integrase inhibitors, so we don't know if this could be a class effect, or really for any other ARV minus perhaps AZT. So, there also was data presented at IAS in July and at the European AIDS conference a week ago, trying to look at the rates of neural tube defects at conception with dolutegravir in countries that do fortify the food supply with folate. But you can see here the overall numbers are quite low. And when researchers from the Antiretroviral Pregnancy Registry, uh, which is largely instances from the United States, presented this, they said it would probably take 2,000 or more cases to really rule out any signal for dolutegravir conception. So this is my plug that if you are following a uh, person who has conceived or is pregnant on any, anti any antiretroviral, please register them here because that's how we get this data and can confirm or rule out these findings. Uh, it's very easy to do, although the other day I put the website in and it was down. So hopefully they get that back up soon uh, so that my plug is accurate. Uh, one notable thing is that in reviewing all of this data and in interviewing a lot of people and getting qualitative feedback from people around the world, the WHO has recommended Dolly Tegavir as the preferred HIV treatment option in all populations. So the question I would pose to you is now given all of those updates, and I do not know that we have a clear answer, if you were advising a person who wanted to conceive and was choosing either initial antiretroviral therapy or a switch, what would you recommend? So would you say, okay, we have enough data for Dolly Tegavir plus FTC TDF, and I'm not giving you TAF here because TAF really hasn't been studied uh, in pregnancy, raltegravir, efavirenz, ropivirine, boosted azanavir, boosted durinavir. I think in, in clinical practice, I've, I've seen all of these done in this situation. Any, anyone want to shout out what you think is best? Let's say, uh, let's say very adherent, no resistance, suppressed viral load. So you have any of these options and, op and no other medication interactions. And uh, let's, make it the, let's make this the only variable. So maybe it's shared decision making. Maybe it's individualized. Uh, maybe it's some counseling about this and deciding how worried a person is about this. Uh, but let me, let me push you. They say, whatever you recommend. Okay, I'll let you ponder that. And I take the silence to mean this is very controversial these days and we don't know. So one thing I would note is that the HHS guidelines, both adult treatment and perinatal treatment have not been updated, though I know that both panels are actively discussing this and working on updates. So we will see how those guidelines address the latest data and this issue. 
And if you have further thoughts towards the end, I think we'll have time for any other comments. Let me then turn to this. What are the advantages of dual ART or two active drugs? I've mentioned this at prior conferences, but traditionally, you know, for the last however many years, the standard for ART has been three active agents, both up front and if we're switching. And I think now that we have potent drugs like dolutegravir and bucidurunavir and accumulating data that for certain individuals, those who take their meds, those who are suppressed, uh, those who have no resistance to agents, I, two drugs seems to maintain viral suppression quite well. There was one study, one robust study of uh, two agents up front called Gemini, which was dolutegravir lamivudine as upfront treatment for treatment naive individuals really also did uh, quite well, but I'm not gonna review that. I'm really gonna focus on the switch options because I think that's what's being considered more often in clinical practice. This is also a real patient from my clinic where this came up and I, I kind of struggled with this. So I'd like to ask your question. So this is a 54 year old cisgender man, suppressed HIV RNA for years on dolutegravir, bacavir, 3TC or triomec. Uh, that was his first regimen, uh, no underlying resistance. You can see here the comorbidities, include, including what I, was, what I would describe as metabolic syndrome. Uh, you can see the other medications being treated for the above, normal renal function, and a cardiovascular risk estimate of 10.3%. So here's my, my question for you. What would be the best update to his ART? I've given you the options here, uh, dolutegravir plus, you can see here the NRTI backbone, or bictegravir or pivirine, or the two drug options of dolutegravir or pivirine or dolutegravir lamivudine, or no update, he's, he's doing well, and don't rock the boat. And uh, we can also maybe consider in the background what I showed you about weight change. So again, I'll just put it out there to you and let's posit that he's saying, I'll do whatever you recommend. Which one of these would you advise? Did we switch to decaf coffee this morning? Let's... <laughs> no right answer, Bob? There's many options there. I mean, I've been a, an advocate for dolutegravir with pivot since it came out. I think that um, I've, I've surprised that dolutegravir 3TC has done so well because I think the 184B can happen so quickly and easily. Um, so even though the Gemini data suggests that even in naive individuals it's still is, is good, it makes me a little nervous. I'm more comfortable with what I think is a more potent agent uh, with pivot. So Deluca would be a good choice, and I think we'll be there for the game right now. Okay. So a vote, if you couldn't hear our, those remotely participating, a vote for dolutegravir ropivirine, a two-drug agent called Jaluca. Other votes? Trisha? I think any option A through D. Any option A through D. I think it would, again, share decision-making about whether they're willing to take it with food. I think that's actually a big deal that some people with food insecurity may not be able to manage getting that to work and take it at the same time or if they have hectic schedules. So I think, and then how much do they want one pill once a day? So I think based on that, it could be any of those options. And their adherence, like Dina said before, for that other patient, if they um, are potentially less adherent, then C is not a good option. And I don't think B is a good option. So again, a argument for individualized and shared decision making, and I think that makes a lot of sense. And Trisha mentioned some of the factors to consider, food requirements, drug, drug interactions, history of adherence, and those might steer you towards one versus another. I, I do think uh, the, the point that Bob brought up about uh, changing a Bacavir is a really good one. I'm not going to go into the data for a Bacavir and cardiovascular risk. I am feeling much more convinced about that these days, though I, I will just say now we have two studies uh, um, identifying a mechanism for that. At Croy, we saw two studies of a Bacavir, one which increased platelet activation, the other which increased platelet aggregation. So I do think finally there's a proposed mechanism, but the studies are quite diverse in their findings about whether the risk increases with recent use, with cumulative use, and who really is at highest risk for that. But I think as Bob mentioned, uh, my practice now has been for individuals with high cardiovascular risk to really try to change a Bacavir if there are effective alternatives. That's my brief two cents about that. These, This is a composite of all the prospective randomized control trials of two drug maintenance ART. So again, maintenance ART is describing an individual who has a history of good adherence, viral load suppression, and now is switching to a two drug option. So 
I bolded the two combination pills approved by the FDA, including dolutegravir ropivirine, which is Jaluca, dolutegravir lamivudine, which is Dovato. Uh, you can see here the and these are larger randomized control trials, and then the smaller trials of dolutegravir plus emtricitabine or FTC, busidronavir plus lamivudine or busidronavir plus dolutegravir. These are the prospective studies that I think are most relevant to clinical practice and that have been presented or published. The one that I'm going to highlight here is Tango, because I think this is a robust study and one of the few that compared to taf based three drug ART, and I really think in clinic that's what we're considering, and updates to either taf based three drug ART, like Bictagravir FTC TAF, for example, or Ropivirin FTC TAF versus a two drug option. So let me just show you briefly about Tango, and then we will have time at the end for, for your comments on all of these topics. So this was a phase three randomized open label trial, which enrolled uh, adults with HIV with RNA that was less than 50 copies for at least six months on stable three drug TAF based ART. Uh, Importantly, hepatitis B co-infection was an exclusion criteria here and really should be an exclusion criteria to any of these two drug options because they do not provide adequate treatment for hepatitis B infection. Individuals in this trial could not have documented prior virologic failure or documented NRTI or integrated resistance, uh, though a couple instances of NRTI resistance were found, which I will mention, and individuals were randomized to dolutegravir lamivudine dolutegravir 3 tc two-drug therapy versus TAF-based three-drug ART, and the primary endpoint was virologic response at 48 weeks by FDA snapshot. These are the enrollment characteristics you can see, as in many trials. Uh, these are largely relatively young, largely men, largely Caucasian men. I think it's a limitation of many randomized trials uh, looking at HIV treatment. And just to note the baseline third agent class, so again, all these individuals were enrolled taking three drug ART. Primarily, they were taking integrase inhibitors, and most commonly in this trial, that was boosted L-vitegravir, and the uh, most common NRTI was ropivirin, and the most common PI was boosted darunavir. This is the key virologic response finding. So this is by intention to treat at 48 weeks. You can see here the viral load suppression rate. Most, so 93% about in each arm, documenting non-inferiority of the two-drug maintenance therapy compared to TAP-based three-drug ART. Most of this gap here, the individuals um, not captured in the 93% were not virologic failures, but, but missing data because this is intention to treat. A couple of notes that confirm withdrawal for virologic failure was quite rare in both arms. No new resistance mutations occurred, coming back to Bob's point that you know, lamivudine tends to be very susceptible to misdoses, and people do develop the M1A4 IRV mutation quite readily. But it does seem, at least based on the data we have, that dolutegravir, the potency of dolutegravir, seems to prevent or overcome that. I, I don't know what to make of this, but by proviral or DNA or archive genotypes, four participants did have a baseline M1A4 mutation in the dolutegravir 3 ETC arm and did fine. I, perhaps. Perhaps dolutegravir, lamivudine, even the setting of 184V might be okay, but I personally would not ever rely on that until we know more. And a couple of notes about the adverse effects. So there were greater declines in estimated GFR, renal function, the switch groups, but I think it's hard to interpret because these individuals were all switching to dolutegravir, which we know raises serum creatinine in a very benign way. So I sort of um, eliminate that in my interpretation. Importantly, again, we're comparing two drugs without TAF to three drugs with TAF. There was no clear difference in markers of proximal tubulopathy. There was no clear winner in markers of bone turnover. I think this is what we were most interested in to see if there would be a big benefit of eliminating TAF and using two drug therapy. When I interpret this, I do not see a big benefit, at least based on this study. Mean weight increase was similar between the arms. There was some improvement. This was uh, from an update at the European AIDS conference. There was some improvement in lipids and insulin resistance, um, but I don't know. Again, that's overall, I don't know how many of those were participants switching from a PI versus the other classes. So I, I think this is intriguing. And again, I'll give you a question to reflect on. So what really are the advantages of dolutegravir lamivudine maintenance compared to TAF-based three drug ART? The investigators here concluded that there is, quote unquote, reduced ARV exposure, 
my question to you is what exactly does that mean? How beneficial is that in the long term? And how should we be incorporating this data into clinical decision making? And, and I think this is really interesting. I, I will admit that my decision making process in clinic has really been, okay, this person is on three drug ART. Do they have a strong indication for two drug ART? Do they have a real reason to avoid TAF, TDF, or Bacavir, for example? And really only switching to two drug therapy in those cases. However, I have heard it argued by very respected experts around the world that maybe our perspective should be the opposite. Maybe we should be defaulting to two drug ARVs and, and, and really asking the question is, is there a strong indication for three drugs? So I'll ask you which perspective you think is best. Um, let me perhaps, before I do that, while you think about that, let me just turn to a couple other what I think are uh, maybe quicker controversies. I won't go through all the data, but let me just mention a couple quicker controversies. And then we'll have about 15 minutes to ask your thoughts on all of these topics. I'd like you all to tell me the right answers. So. Oh, actually, first, before I turn to other topics, a couple other novel two drug options coming because I think these are of great interest. So first, the maintenance studies of a switch to two drug long acting injectable therapy. So this is the phase three data uh, presented at CROI. And then uh, I've only seen a press release on this. I haven't seen full data, but the punchline is that again, for very carefully selected individuals, a switch from three drug oral ART to two drug long acting maintenance does seem to be effective. Importantly in these trials, and I'm focusing on Flare and Atlas, instances of virologic failure with new resistance were rare, six instances total between the two studies. And intriguingly, all of those participants were at sites in Russia and had subtype A virus, uh, which is more uncommon here in this country. So I think we need to understand better the risks of missed doses and the risks of virologic failure and risks of resistance. Um, also intriguingly, a new drug application for these long acting therapy has been submitted. I have not been able to identify any updates on when the FDA might rule on that. Generally, it's about a six month process, but I have not heard any updates. If anyone here has, please feel free to chime in. But those are the updates on that therapy. And I think that we will get interesting new data from this study, which I believe Anne and others are involved in and is enrolling here. So if you have a person who may qualify, uh, please contact the ACTG group here. So this is the Latitude study, uh, long acting therapy to improve treatment success in daily life. Enrolling, and this is the key difference in this trial than the others I showed you, enrolling individuals who have a history of imperfect adherence, who do have a viral load of up 200 copies, they are receiving 24 weeks of standard uh, oral ART with financial incentives. And then if suppressed, randomizing to continue oral ART versus every four week injectable cabotegravir ropivirine, sorry, oral first to make sure individuals tolerate it and then monthly cab ropivirine. I think that my outstanding questions about this therapy include what is the optimal lead-in period, usually a lead-in or always a lead-in is required to make sure a person tolerates the medication because these are long acting. If there is a side effect, there's really no way to get rid of the meds out of the body and the half-life is very long and these medications do last in the body up to six to 12 months. What is the risk of missed doses? Uh, if a person is stopping, what is the necessary oral tail? Again, very long half-life with, with these agents and who really are the best candidates. And I think when we think about long-acting oral, oral, long-acting injectable therapy, you know, often we're most interested for people who have a trouble adhering or taking oral therapy. So I think that we really need better answers to these questions. And anything you want to add about that study? Okay. Okay. Thanks, Amber. Okay, thank you. So please consider your patients or clients for that trial. The other thing is coming in terms of dual ART, which is intriguing, is this combination of Islatravir. This used to be called MK, MK some numbers or EFDA or the soy sauce drug. Um, I've mentioned it before, it was discovered by a soy sauce company in Japan and then sold to uh, a large pharmaceutical company. It is the first NRTTI 
Uh, you can see here what that stands for. I admit I'm still digesting exactly what that means and how it compares to a traditional NRTI. I think there are big potential advantages of this drug. It has what seems to be a high barrier to resistance and activity in the setting of uh, some NRTI resistance mutations and very few drug interactions, and most importantly, a very long half-life. So this has the potential for oral therapy, uh, dosed much less than daily or injectable therapy, dosed infrequently, or what made headlines uh, in the last few months, potential for a once-a-year PrEP implant. So stay tuned for more on that. And then at the IAS meeting, we saw this study of simplifying to is latrovir deravirine to drug therapy and in the small number of individuals that did seem to be effective. So stay tuned for more on that. So now a few other quicker notes about controversies that come up in clinic and then perhaps 10 minutes for your questions and comments. So a question that arises not infrequently are our TAF, 3TC or lamivudine, FTC or intracytobine safe with advanced renal disease? I define that as an estimated GFR or creatinine clearance below 15 to 30. My answer is probably, and it's largely based on this study led by Joe Aaron, who enrolled individuals with estimated GFR below 15, all on hemodialysis, all were switched to elvitegravir cobi fcc taf which is Genvoya, and at 96 weeks, a very large percentage remained suppressed, but you would note that this is a small N. So a suggestion that FTC, and I think by way of reasoning, also 3TC as well as TAF may be fine on chronic hemodialysis. Personally, I'd like to see another study confirming this, this is only one trial, uh, but I do think that if pressed and if there are no other options for somebody with renal function in this range, I would be okay with these agents. And I will admit that I'm pretty lenient about uh, the dose of 3TC and FTC, even when GFR falls, because they are so well tolerated. If you look in the guidelines, they say to dose reduce at a GFR less than 50. I really personally let that slide. Maybe I should admit that to you know, 30 or so. Um, so that's my two cents on that topic. The other question, are dolutegravir and FTC TAF, FTC TAF or bictegravir FTC TAF sufficient in the setting of an isolated M184V? This has been an outstanding question for a while. I, I will just share that I think they probably are, especially if somebody has a low or undetectable viral load, and I've been fine with that in clinic and seen success with it. I think we now have the best prospective data on this from the Donning study, uh, done largely in Sub-Saharan Africa. These were individuals with a history of NNRTI failure, randomized to dolutegravir plus two NRTIs versus boosted lopinavir plus two NRTIs, the dolutegravir arm was superior and over 80% in this arm had an M184V or I mutation, some with additional mutations. So my strategy has become that if a person has a suppressed or low viral load, I think we can debate what low viral load means, and an M184V, and that's really the only significant NRTI mutation, I feel fine about either of these options. If a person has a high viral load, I would not rely on that up front. We talked about a case on ECHO a couple weeks ago, somebody with an M184V and a viral load of a million and we advise to use uh, potentially one of these options plus another agent at least until the viral load came down. And I think that would be my strategy, but that uh, is my current practice. And I think that's a longstanding question that we finally have better answers to. This question has also come up, which I think is interesting. So are dolutegravir FCC TAF or bictegravir FCC TAF sufficient if somebody has very advanced HIV? HIV disease? My answer would be yes in most cases. There are now three case reports of resistance developing to dolutegravir in individuals who started that as their first ever regimen. Only three case reports uh, compared to the thousands or hundreds of thousands or more individuals who are now taking dolutegravir as their first regimen. But of note, in all those three cases, they were individuals with very high viral loads, very low CD4 counts, a complicating infection, and two of them were on rifamycins, one for tuberculosis, one for a disseminated staph aureus infection. So the question that comes up, and this may come up as uh, an inpatient, for example, is if someone fits this very advanced HIV category and they have an OI, and especially if they're on a rifamycin, would you trust these regimens alone or would you add a fourth agent? I don't think anyone knows. Nina? Um, you know, we, we were talking about, um, it, actually in the context of the advanced trial, mm. I believe, that we were struck by the fact that the, um, I think it was the 48 weeks viral suppression rate was not as high as was seen in the regist registration trials here in the United States, 
where you know we were seeing things you know the rates approaching 90 percent it was more like 80 percent if i'm not mistaken if not lower even for these women and um <laughs> i don't know if uh so i i think you know I'm very curious to see the real world data with Dalio Tegravira as, as, as TLD rolls out, um, just because we're talking about different clades, we're talking about people with very high viral levels, a lot more people with very high viral levels compared with, the, you know, these clinical trials that we keep looking at. Um, so anyway. Nina, thank you very much for that point. I think it's a fantastic point. Anne? Yeah, the issue, issue of the, the interaction with, um, Rifamycin, especially rifampin, in a setting where TB prevalence and incidence are so high, and with the need to the recommendation to adjust the dose of dilutegravir up to 50 twice a day if there is concurrent um, use of rifampin, it just makes things much more complicated in a setting with TLD where you're trying to streamline things. Absolutely, and in a setting where there often are lots of other medications and comorbidities. <clears throat> if I remember right, one of these instances, a person did get BID dolutavir as recommended, and the other they did not. I'd have to confirm that, but that's my recollection. There is a study, another study enrolling called Laptop. Someday I'd like to be a fly on the wall with coming up with these trial names, um, which I believe is the, oh gosh, the it's the late presentation treatment optimization trial where people fitting this category are being randomized to either an integrase inhibitor or a boosted PI. So I think we will get that data as well in terms of which option is more effective. That's my other summary. Bob, please go ahead. I, I wondered, uh, these three cases you talk about, did any of them fail with resistance to the other drugs besides Valutegravir? That's, that's a great question. I, I'd have to look back at that to see. Because if they had cryptic mutations to the other drugs and they're, they're essentially on Valutegravir as one of two drugs or a monotherapy, that might explain that. Great question. I think we do have good data now that Valutegravir monotherapy is not sufficient, despite the data that dual therapy may be effective. So appreciate that question. I'd have to look at the case reports to see whether there was any documented based on resistance or new NRTI resistance for the failure. So here are the questions that I've asked you to ponder. I'd love to hear your comments on any of these. Again, I pose this because I think they are common clinical conundrums for which we don't know the right answer. So would you alter your choice or recommendation for initial ART due to the concern for weight change? Or will this data alter your counseling about switch or updates to new regimens? What is the optimal ART regimen during conception or early pregnancy? Should we be defaulting to three-drug ART or two-drug ART? And if there's any other controversies that came up for you that I didn't think about, please feel free to note those. So in the last five minutes, questions or comments or answers? Heidi, please. Um, not to those, but to the earlier question at EAC, you, were, you made a comment about when they expect the dual injectable at EAC. They were, seeing, they were saying FDA approval in December. Is that right? Thank you, Heidi, for that update. I had not seen that. So uh, if you didn't hear that, potential FDA uh, approval or FDA response about I am Ropiparin and I am Cabotegravir in December. Thank you, Heidi. Other questions or comments? Matt? Do you think you jumped the gun when you keep on this slogan as opposed to conventional, you know, conventional tenofovir given this weight gain and the very modest benefits associated with that? So appreciate the questions. The question is, do we jump the gun going to TAF either for you know, treatment naive individuals or for a switch? And what I've noticed, I think that practice is highly variable in terms of updating everyone from TD to F to TAF or updating only those who are high risk for renal problems for uh, low bone mineral density. So I'll put that question back to you. What's your practice been? And again, coming back to the question I posed at the, be at the beginning, should we be early adopters of these new therapies or more cautious and waiting for better understanding of the side effects? So what's, what's your practice been? Anyone willing to share? No right answer. Ann? I have, my practice is heavily weighted toward elderly people who've been on antiretrovirals for a very long time, and I'm seeing a very concerning trend for decreases in estimated creatinine clearance and low-level proteinuria. And so for those individuals, I discuss this issue and have had many people request changing to TAF. Mm -hmm. Um, for everybody who I have, who I'm discussing new antiretrovirals and who is on dolutegravir, I discuss the potential for weight gain 
and then use some kind of shared decision making. And I've had a, a number of predominantly black women want to change, um, but not universally at all. Hmm. Interesting. Thank you very much, Anne, for sharing that. Anyone else? Bob? Yeah, I wanted to get to your question number three. And um, just remember what, N and, what NR, NRTIs, uh, our experience has been over time. We, AZT came along and then we realized how bad it was. And then D4T was everybody's darling for the longest time. And then what a disaster. Same with DDI. Uh, TDF comes along, oh, that's a great drug. And then, oh, well, everyone's got thin bones and, and renal dysfunction. And now we have TAF. So I worry a year from now, what are we going to find out about TAF that, uh, that we currently have no idea about? So I think that the NRTIs, while they're the first uh, drugs we've ever had and are the backbones of therapy, the only one that hasn't bitten us is 3TC and FTC. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, moving away from that class, if we can, and we have other simpler regimens that that uh, avoid those class of drugs, we might be uh, uh, on the right track. Thanks very much, Bob. So what I'm, what I'm hearing is a low threshold to update from TDF to TAF, especially if there's evidence of renal dysfunction or a lot of risk factors or a person who's aging and may have comorbidities. And then you know, for the younger, healthy person with good renal function, I think it's really an individualized pro-con decision. And now the other thing I'm hearing is that the data for weight gain is entering the counseling and that, that discussion and, and the decision making, which I think is very interesting. Amber? We have a question from one of the webinar participants. Any comment on recent reports of hyperglycemia due to dolutegravir in black men? We you clarify that, Amber? Is it hyperglycemia? hyperglycemia. So um, uh, first I would share that in the data I've reviewed, I think that finding has been variable across uh, the various studies. And I, I will only share that I, I do not have a strong sense of uh, in whom, whom is higher, who has the highest risk for that or how frequently we should be considering that. So I think we need more data, but I'll also put that out to the audience and see if any of you have seen that finding or what you think about it. Thank you, Adrian. For, so the, the SAC study, which was very robust, my recollection is overall, they did not find any change in metabolic syndrome or glucose intolerance or blood pressure or anything like that. But in the sub-analyses of, for example, black men, black women, I would have to look back at that study and, and see their finding. That was a very robust study. So if they did find that, I think that is relatively trustworthy data. But I appreciate the question and will be the first to admit that I, I I think we need more on that, and I don't have a strong sense. Other questions or comments before we wrap up? Sylvia, maybe this will be the last question or comment. This is, this is just an interesting controversy that came up recently. A, a fellow texted me about this, um, and the, the discussions around breastfeeding in settings that mm. we live in with the, the availability of formula, et cetera, and how we may be, how our counseling may be changing in the future about should women breastfeed if they're HIV positive in the setting of like well-controlled HIV, et cetera. Um, and I, I, it's interesting. I really appreciate that comment. And I didn't think to include that here, uh, but I talked about it yesterday in the ATC conference. I think there's so much data for U equals U and we put so much faith in U equals U and it's a really powerful message that can reduce stigma. And I show that to patients but really the data is for male to male or male to female sexual transmission. And does U equals U translate to breastfeeding? Does it translate to injection drug users? Does it translate to occupational PEP with a needle stick? That's come up for me twice in clinic recently. And I think we need more data. There was a great recent publication titled, does U equals U, does U, equals U for breastfeeding? So I'd be happy to share that with you. And it really, it really, I think, hit home some of the controversies and how that counseling is changing. And we had a great echo talk from an expert on that who, who really shared that if not breastfeeding is a huge issue, is stigmatizing for a woman that shared decision-making, careful counseling, and monitoring on ART with breastfeeding with more frequent testing may be reasonable for select individuals. So I think that's also evolving, and I really appreciate you bringing that up. Okay, I think we'll end there. Thank you all for coming, and I hope that was useful in some way.